Good morning, everyone. This is Albie Messing from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and we're here to uh, present the third of our annual updates on research in Alexander disease. Basically, what's new from 2015, and uh, I decided to put in one one paper that just came out in early 2016 as well. As always, I want to start by thanking the various groups that have supported our work over the years, especially the NIH and the three funds and the, the donors who have contributed to these funds, the Jack Palmara Fund, the Wanda Fund, and the Yelty Recard Fund. I also, also want to mention that there are two people who will help um, with today's session. Tracy Hagman from my lab will be watching over the chat box on the left-hand side of the screen to make sure I don't miss any of the questions that uh, people might raise. And um, if you have any technical problems, uh, Clark Kellogg um, can hopefully help out with that. His telephone number is 608-263-8726. And his email is Kellogg, that's K-E-L-L-O-G-G, -G, at wason.wisc.edu. The United Leukodystrophy Foundation wanted to need to remind everyone that the meeting this year will again be in Omaha, Nebraska on July 28th through 30th. And I, I will be there, so if any of you um, happen to make it, I could also touch base with you then. So those of you who have listened to this presentation in previous years know that it's not really a, a general overview of the disease, rather it concentrates on just the new findings from the past year. But I do want to present this one slide um, that just discusses some of the, um, the generalities. Um, Alexander disease is genetically homogeneous, which is to say that uh, over 95% of the patients are um, associated or carry mutations in just a single gene, that is GFAP. So there, we don't know any other genes that, that um, cause the disease. It's quite rare, of course, and uh, although we have very um, poor understanding of um, exactly what the prevalence is, it's only been studied in a systematic way once in Japan, and this was published in 2011, where they found the prevalence at around 1 in 2.7 million individuals. And whether those numbers hold up um, in other populations around the world, we just don't know. There's, of course, wide variation in clinical severity um, and also ages of onset. So some have been diagnosed even prenatally. And the latest actually just came out last year, an individual who had his first signs when he was 79 years old. So really um, a lot of variability. So the, I think the major questions that all of us who have been thinking about this disease um, have been wrestling with over the years are these three. How do these GFAP mutations cause the disease? What accounts for the variability? And um, ultimately, of course, are there any options for treatments? So there were actually a lot of things that came out in 2015, so many that I couldn't really discuss all of them. But instead, I decided to group um, them into three categories. Uh, and I'll talk about two papers that um, dealt with some new findings or searches in the field of genetics, uh, two papers talking about um, search for drugs as options for treatment, and um, one paper and one set of new opportunities um, in terms of participation in research. Uh, our biomarker study, which some of you may have participated in, blood, CSF, as well as um, some new options for things um, that are just starting. So let me start out with this um, topic of genetics. And I'll talk about two papers. One that reported an entirely new type of, uh, or a very different type of mutation that hadn't been seen before, a truncation mutation. And the second, a search for GFAP deletions or duplications. 
that's a very different type of change in GFAP than has previously been discussed um, for the disease. And before I get to those two, let me just say um, some things about the GFAP protein and where the known mutations lie. So this is a diagram from a, a review that we published in 2009. Um, so it's a little bit out of date, but still um, gets the picture across. The GFAP protein is shown as this sort of stick figure um, oriented vertically with the amino terminal or head domain at the top and the carboxy terminal or tail domain at the bottom and these boxes in the middle um, representing the central rod domain. Each of the small circles on either side um, represents an individual patient or family and their particular mutation and shows the location along the length of the protein. So what you can see is just from this visual picture that um, there are mutations sprinkled along almost the entire length with uh, the exception of the head domain, but that there are also a couple of hot spots and um, these account for almost 30% of mutations are in these hot spots. Um, nevertheless, uh, so in the hot spots you may have multiple people with the same mutation. Uh, for many of the others though, it's really just a single, a single example that's been found. So this next slide shows this information in a slightly different form. Um, GFAP in humans is 432 amino acids long. Um, of those 432, 69 have been uh, shown uh, to, uh, to be affected by disease-causing mutations. So altering any of these uh, amino acids um, in certain ways can will cause Alexander disease. Some amino acids can be changed in several different ways, and so actually the total number of mutations is 107 um, involving these 69 amino acids. It's really interesting that in the, uh, the next two numbers, um, it shows that only 40 of these, or about one-third, are non-private, which is to say have been found in more than one individual, but 67, or almost two-thirds, are private mutations, which means that's the only person who's ever been seen with that particular mutation. And these two numbers together, the number of private mutations, number of non-private, are really important because it gets at the, the general problem we've had of uh, being able to predict the course that uh, could, uh, the disease might take in any given individual, particularly those who have private mutations where they're the only one we know of with that particular one, and you know, we just don't know how that's going to behave. Even for the non-private mutations, there are very few where there are enough patients where you could just start to get a consistent picture of, of how, how consistent the effects are or how variable they are. Most of these mutations cause um, single amino acid changes. There are some, um, 11 on this table, that cause more complicated changes. Um, that is to say, some, some small insertions or deletions. Um, there's one major internal deletion that, um, that alters the messenger RNA and leads to um, the deletion of around 60 amino acids right in the center of the protein. Um, but the point from all of these um, numbers at the top of this slide is that some protein is being made. A really important, important point is made um, by the line at the bottom having to do with null mutations. So null mutations are those kinds of mutations that cause the absence of any protein to be made. And of course they're very common in other types of genetic disorders, but the point here is that we've never found any null mutations in Alexander disease. All of which gets, makes the point that the problem we think in Alexander disease isn't the absence of a protein, um, it's the presence, instead it's the presence of an abnormal protein well, that's having some sort of toxic effect. And it's along those lines that, um, that this, uh, new, one of these new publications um, came out um, and uh, reported a different kind of mutation that instead of causing a single amino acid change, caused a truncation. 
have a, a major truncation. So um, we're losing um, maybe 70 or 80, about oh, 120, uh, 120 amino acids. So this slide just shows the title of this. Um, it's from a group of authors in Korea. Again, the GFAP um, protein is shown diagrammatically now oriented horizontally on the bottom, the head on the left, tail on the right. And um, usually the DNA and RNA code it are three nucleotides that together that encode a single amino acid. Um, but as the uh, cell is reading the message, translating it into protein, eventually it gets, uh, it has to stop. And the way it stops is because it gets to a three base pair code that instead of encoding an amino acid, is called a stop code. And that's what tells the protein synthesis machinery that you're at the end of the protein and to stop. So in the case of GFAP, after amino acid 432, normally comes a stop code. On. What these authors found was a patient who, at position 312, instead of encoding glutamate as the amino acid, the mutation converted this three base pair code into a stop codon. So instead of translating all the way to the end, getting to 432, it thinks it's supposed to stop at 312. And the result then was that this one quarter of the whole protein was just gone. But while saying that the carboxy terminal tail are gone, um, also says that the rest of it is still here. And again, this is consistent with the general notion that it's not the absence of protein, but it's the presence of an abnormal protein, in this case, just a severely shortened one that is causing problems and, and leading to all the consequences we associate with Alexander disease. The second uh, paper I want to mention in genetics uh, really addresses two issues. Um, the, the questions they're asking are whether um, GFAP mutations, other than the ones that are typically uh, detected by standard genetic testing, uh, uh, can either cause or modify disease, these being either gene duplications or deletions or duplications. And the, the issue about duplications is of interest is because, uh, remember, there are 5% uh, of patients who have no identifiable GFAP mutations. Um, and, but remember, the you know, standard type of genetic testing, it's only designed to test for the kinds of mutations we were talking about on the previous slides, um, small changes in the sequence. Um, in theory, at least, we've always believed that gene duplications, where the entire gene is duplicated. So you've got between chromosome, your two chromosome 17s, you've got three copies of GFAP instead of just two. We've always thought that that could, in theory, cause disease, um, but we've never found any. Um, and in addition to duplications just causing disease, we also imagined, or at least there's been speculation, that if you've got a disease-causing mutation on one chromosome, um, what about the other chromosome? Is it possible that you have either a gene duplication or a deletion on the other chromosome, and that modifies the disease um, by influencing the levels of protein that are being made? And could that be a, one of the causes for all the variability we see in the disorder, even among patients who have the same mutation? So it was really these two questions that these authors were interested in getting at. They designed assays that were really very accurate for detecting duplications or deletions. And they looked at an interesting group of patients. For the, the group that um, were uh, addressing the question of could duplications cause disease, they looked at 69 people who had the suspicion of Alexander disease but no identifiable GFAP mutations. For the, for the question about whether GFAP deletions or duplications could, cause, could modify disease, they had 28 patients with known GFAP mutations on one of their chromosome 17s, um, and presumably a normal GFAP sequence on the other. And then, just for the possibility that 
GFAP duplications or deletions could cause an entirely different kind of leukodystrophy. They had 80 patients with so-called unclassified leukodystrophies where there were no known genetic causes. And the bottom line from this entire set was that no copy number variants of GFAP were found. So even though this is, uh, you know, a small number by some standards, it's the largest number that's ever been analyzed, and GFAP copy number variants aren't, uh, aren't really, uh, aren't really, haven't been found uh, to be informative for any of these, these patients. Okay, so actually, let me just pause for a second in case anybody wants to ask questions about the genetics in particular. And maybe, Clark, could you come over here and help me expand the chat box so I can see it? Okay, so if there are no questions yet, um, let's go on. Lithium was of interest because there were grounds to believe that lithium would, would influence both of these uh, processes, that lithium might actually prevent this increase in synthesis that occurs, and that it might actually overcome this, de this change in the degradation. Um, side of the pathway. So, um, so lithium was interesting in these grounds. Certainly, it's a drug that's been around for uh, millennia. Clinicians have. So this is a complicated slide, but it shows the, the gist of um, uh, the findings from this paper. Um, and what we're the y-axis in different regions of the um, central nervous system. And then on the top panel is GFAP protein, um, again, in the same regions of the, of the central nervous system. And notice also that the y-axis in each case is broken so that, um, uh, and actually this, it looks like the scale um, has changed in the top part versus the bottom part. Um, in each of these. So if you look at olfactory bulb, for instance, as one example, it's clear that if you give, uh, and this is using the mouse model, uh, if you give lithium at 0.5% in the diet, so this is just ground up into the food pellets, for a period of four weeks, then you see, and these are um, control mice with, with normal GFAP, uh, with or without lithium over here, and then the GFAP mutant mice in the black would be the ones in uh, given the control diet, and then in the the, um, uh, the slightly lighter bars over here are the GFAP mutants um, given the lithium diet. So first of all, you see in the control diets we we observe the expected increase in GFAP levels that we've known about for some time. That's Part of what's led to the idea that it's this accumulation above a toxic threshold that causes problems. And if you look at several of these regions, olfactory bulb, hippocampus, and cortex, um, lithium is causing a reduction in expression, both at the level of message and at the level of protein. So that's a really encouraging thing uh, to see. Um, there are some areas, such as the brain stem and the cerebellum, um, where lithium didn't um, have any effect. And then spinal cord is a, a really strange situation that we don't completely understand. Lithium is causing uh, a reduction there. Um, so the overall message from this slide is that lithium can um, cause a reduction in GFAP. Um, whether it's enough of a reduction to be meaningful uh, to reverse clinical symptoms, we don't yet know. But it still means that, in theory, you can change this um, 
this expression of GFAP. That's the good side of lithium. Um, there are some bad sides to lithium. One is that the therapeutic window is very narrow. So this data is from mice who were fed 0.5% for four weeks. When we fed them 0.3%, we saw no change. When we fed them 0.7%, um, it was no better. Um, so, uh, so it's really going from 0.3 to 0.5 that, that made a difference uh, to start to see an effect. Um, but then the next thing you have to think about is whether there are side effects, are there deleterious side effects of taking lithium. And some of you may know that um, there are actually a number of side effects that are very well known from, um, from the human experience uh, about taking lithium. And um, so there's always going to be a concern about that. But if you just look at the mouse data, we can clearly see, it, see that there are side effects. So this is um, showing the survival of animals uh, in this left-hand graph, the survival of animals over the course of four weeks. Um, again, the GFAP normal mice versus the mutant mice on the control diet versus the lithium diet. And you can see, at least over this treatment period, um, essentially, there was no effect on survival, but what did happen right away is that during the first week, they actually get a lower dose of lithium, and then they get switched over to the 0.5%, and as soon as they get switched to the 0.5%, they stop gaining weight. And this is uh, an age range at which these mice are normally growing and normally putting on weight. And when you start giving them the 0.5% lithium, they clearly don't like it. And the, um, the, the control mice, in fact, put on the lithium diet, started to lose weight. Um, the, the mutant mice put on lithium to stop, they just flattened out. So clearly there's something about the lithium that the mice don't like. Um, what was even more of a concern, though, was that we, you know, we, we figured, okay, four weeks of treatment caused this modest reduction in GFAP. What happens if we keep treating them for a longer period of time? Would the GSAP levels go down um, even farther? When we did that and we treat the mice for eight weeks, then the mice started dying. And, um, and it looked like the GFAP mutant mice were, at, were more susceptible than GFAP wild types. So in this group, after eight weeks of treatment, um, a little bit more than 40% mice 40% of the mice uh, had died. So clearly, um, this is what tells us that the, the therapeutic range for lithium is very narrow. Um, you go below 0.5%, it's not effective. You go um, above 0.5% or for longer periods of time, then it's clearly toxic. And so I think the take home message here is that there are ways that we might we can reduce GFAP, but uh, lithium in particular is not one that we would recommend for uh, testing in a clinical trial. The risks are just too great. Okay, so I think at this point, I'll pause again in case anybody wants to ask questions about uh, about lithium. Okay, if not, let me go on to the next attempt to find drugs. And this, this study, um, which came out of our collaborator Mel Feeney's lab at Brigham and Women's Hospital, done by our postdoctoral fellow, Lee Chung Wang, is using the Drosophila model of Alexander disease. And um, in, in the case of Drosophila, one of the uh, the main reasons for doing this is that you can um, take advantage of the enormous uh, wealth of information, the genetic information that's available um, for, um, for these animals. And um, it, there are ways that you can use to use the flies to test large numbers of, of um, compounds in a fairly short period of time. So, uh, I put this diagram, or at least part of this diagram, up on the Facebook page um, 
several weeks ago. And so basically what they did was screened a library of almost 2,000 uh, compounds. And what they do is they put uh, about 12 to 15 flies in each vial, and then they treat those flies with any with each of these uh, 2,000 compounds uh, for uh, uh, for 10 days, and then after 10 days of treatment, then they collect their fly heads, um, they section them, and what they were looking for basically was to find uh, find drugs that prevented the um, the glial induced neuronal death that they had previously described in these fly models of Alexander disease. And to make a long story short, they found actually four um, four particular drugs that they thought really um, interrupted this glial induced neuronal toxicity. Um, some of them are uh, you, you may have heard of uh, citalopram, um, teloxetine. Um, citalopram is an antidepressant. Teloxetine, I think, is an antidepressant as well. Um, and then glycopyrrolate, which is an antagonist of uh, a particular type of um, neurotransmitter receptor um, known as muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. And for a variety of reasons, they decided to really concentrate on um, glycopyrrolate and these muscarinic receptors because uh, these, these category of receptors were well known to be expressed in astrocytes and, um, and to potentially modify um, astrocyte functions. Um, what, um, and I'm jumping ahead over several uh, parts of this story, but what they then found was that there was increased expression of this one type of acetylcholine receptor um, in the brains of Alexander disease patients. And what you're looking at here is a Western blot, which <coughs> measures, <coughs> excuse me, measures the amount of protein. So if the intensity of these bands reflects the uh, level of protein. And we've got three control individuals over here, three Alexander disease patients over here, um, normalized against a control protein, this gap DH, and then um, this graph on the right-hand side shows it, uh, the same data quantified. So you can see that in these Alexander patients, there's a significant increase in the, um, in the levels of this M1 acetylcholine receptor, all of which leads to the idea that, um, that interfering with the signaling through this acetylcholine receptor pathway, such as with an antagonist, um, might be a, a useful approach to take in Alexander disease. And um, even though this library that they screened was a library that was um, enriched in compounds um, approved by the FDA, um, I guess I want to emphasize that the take-home message here isn't so much that glycopyrrolate now should be tested in Alexander disease, but rather that it's identifying um, different pathways of astrocyte function that might be modified and and give us new um, therapeutic targets to investigate in the future. Um, so, um, you know, the real point is that there is this change that we didn't realize occurred before um, in, in acetylcholine receptors and acetylcholine signaling um, in the brains of, of Alexander disease patients. Um, and that's something that really needs more investigation. Okay, so at this point, let me move on to, um, and again, whenever you want to start typing in questions to the chat room, Tracy will see them and, and throw something at me if I should stop. So let me move on to this third topic, the biomarker study. and um, And, uh, this is something that we started a long time ago. Some of you may have actually participated in it, and so it, um, it finally um, came out last year. So let me start out by um, addressing this question, what is a biomarker? So um, this was um, defined um, over 10 years ago 
as a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes, or pharmacological responses to a therapeutic intervention. And so there's been a great deal of interest in um, identifying biomarkers because they could be um, the most effective and efficient way of conducting clinical trials in order to um, test whether things might be appropriate treatments. So I see there are a couple of questions starting to pop up. Um, yeah, so I can read these. Uh, okay, so uh, so the first question, and actually, Clark, can um, can everyone see the chat room? Yes. Okay, so everybody sees these questions, but maybe if somebody's looking at this on a phone, I'll, I'll repeat it anyway. So the first question, is there any data on the effects of cycling the mice on and off doses of lithium in their diet? So that's a really good question, and it's something, let me go back to this um this slide right here. So this is a slide where we treated mice for eight weeks with lithium, and you can see that this is where they're starting to die. We um, we tried an experiment where we um, treated them for four weeks. I think we gave them a one or a two week break, and then we put them back on lithium for another four weeks. And um, the results were that there was still toxicity. Um, and there was not a uh, big change in GFAP expression. So, um, you know, I, the idea of cycling on and off is a really good one, and it's it's something that's used, I think, in a not in a lot of different clinical settings. Um, if we if we had a drug that that maybe wasn't as risky as lithium, I think that's something that we would continue to to investigate, um, but we, we decided it was just going to take too much effort for only a modest benefit to continue to try those experiments um, with lithium. So the uh, the second question is, um, are drugs used for multiple sclerosis ever considered for use in Alexander disease? And the answer to that is, um, Certainly, for the drugs that are currently approved for um, Alexander disease, um, things like beta interferon, that's really inter interrupting the inflammatory pathway in Alexander disease in multiple sclerosis, and and so that hasn't been considered for um, for Alexander disease. There's a new drug that I talked about a little bit last year um, called Tecfidera, um, which interrupts a, uh, which actually activates what's thought to be a protective stress pathway um, in Alexander disease. And uh, that is being tried informally, at least, in a few patients. Um, but it hasn't been um, organized into an official clinical trial with, with uh, you know, a, a meaningful number of patients or any kind of agreement on what the outcome measures will be to decide whether it's effective. So those are the only two that are worth mentioning um, right now. I think MS is certainly um, a disorder that we want to watch closely, um, both because of, uh, you know, these potential protective effects of, of these stress pathways, as well as um, other attempts that people are trying to develop to promote remyelination in the central nervous system. And, you know, I think a long-term goal for Alexander disease is that we stop the astrocyte problem first, and then um, it may be that some of these um, newer newer ideas for promoting remyelination, um, that none of which have yet reached the stage of clinical practice, I should say, but um, maybe remyelination um, therapies then come in as a second stage of treatment after you stop the astrocyte problem. Okay, so uh, so there's a question about how does lithium bring down the expression of GSAP? Well, 
Um, so that gets into the details of this slide right here. Um, there's um, there are a number of ways in which uh, GFE peak transcription um, is, is from the DNA to the RNA is being controlled, and we believe that one um, one way in which lithium acts is by preventing um, the activation of some of the regulatory elements in the GFAP gene that then lead to this increase in transcription. So that's um, that's actually our favored hypothesis for how it's reducing it. Um, when we originally started the experiment, there was also the idea that GFAP would increase one particular degradation pathway, although in our experiments, we couldn't find any evidence that that had happened. So that um, we think the, the lithium effect is really on this left side of the equation. OK, so then there's another question about, um, it's a much more general question about Alexander's symptoms presence of the disease versus symptoms that indicate progression. Um, so Tracy, you should help me to remember this question, because I'd like to come back to this after we get through the biomarker clip. Okay. Um, um, okay, so let's move on to the biomarker. Okay, so um, so this is the definition of a biomarker, and actually, um, it's just the idea that clinical symptoms such as seizures uh, uh, or swallowing difficulties can be um, very difficult to measure in a quantitative way um, and track over time. That's part of what's driven this whole interest in the field of biomarkers. Can we identify something that's more quantitative and easier to measure? Um, that would be uh, a better way to track response to therapy. So our idea about a biomarker began with our studies in mouse models, where we, uh, where Tracy published over 10 years ago that there was this spontaneous increase in expression of GFAP. Here um, in the uh, in the left-hand portion of this uh, panel shown in terms of GFAP message, and then two different measures of protein. And what we're looking at here are normal mice versus two different uh, mutations. And basically, the levels of GFAP protein in brain corresponded to basically the severity of the, um, of the disease in these mice. What we subsequently found um, was that you can also measure GFAP in the cerebrospinal fluid. So this is a fluid that's bathing the brain. And the spinal and the spinal spinal cord, and um, and the levels of GFAP that are in the CSF more or less levels uh, mirror the levels that are in brain. So um, we're showing the same control in two different GFAP mutants over here as we've had in the left hand panel. Plus we added in another one that's even more severely affected than these two. And so you can see that that the amount of GFAP in CSF might be a good way to indirectly um, check what is what is in brain. And I see there's a question about steroids, so we'll come back to that later. OK, so um, based on that mouse work, we decided, um, I think, maybe 2007 or 2008 to um, start uh, an Alexander disease biomarker study in human patients. Um, basically asking, can we measure GFAP in CSF? How consistently does it change? And can we also find it in more convenient um, fluids that could be sampled, such as blood? And this ended up being uh, part of the PhD project of a graduate student in my lab, Paige Janey, who is in the lower right, and uh, a very large group of international collaborators shown up here. But especially, I wanted to highlight uh, the roles of Adeline Vandeveer in Washington, Florian Eichler in Boston, and Mario Vanderknapp in Amsterdam, who were really um, 
key collaborators in this whole project. So the design of this biomarker study was that the, um, in order to be a participant, you had to have a genetic diagnosis, that is, a confirmed mutation in GFAP. Um, we were able to get CSF only in the form of what were referred to as leftover clinical samples. So the CSF had been taken for um, some sort of diagnostic or clinical purpose, um, and then um, and then we were allowed to use whatever was left over. So altogether, we were able to collect 12 um, samples um, representing 10 different mutations. For blood, of course, we could get a lot more. So blood, we were allowed to collect uh, new samples. This was um, done in the form of plasma. In contrast to the CSF, the blood, we could really standardize uh, the process and what was done for it. And altogether, we got 48, um, uh, 48 samples um, representing 26 mutations and, um, interestingly, three uh, parent-child pairs. Um, um, all right, so there's a question about whether, um, I think the question is about Amy Waldman from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She was not part of this initial study, although um, she's a very active collaborator now, and I'm going to mention some of her stuff right at the end of, of this presentation. Okay, so this was the design. Um, some of you who were participants may remember that we were asking for urine samples also. And um, what we published uh, in this paper um, is really only on CSF and blood. We didn't say anything about urine. And um, I'll just mention that um, urine was collected because, number one, um, it's so easy to collect, and we figured this would be the best time to get it. Um, number two, there was a sort of a theoretical but fairly far-fetched rationale for why GFAP might be present in urine. Um, but number three was urine turned out to be very complicated to analyze. Um, and either the pH or um, the or some other biochemical feature of the urine really knocked down the sensitivity of the GFAP assay by uh, a significant amount. So we ended up thinking that urine, we really couldn't figure out how to analyze GFAP in urine. And given the unlikeliness that it would be there in the first place, um, we just put the urine study on hold until we find someone who could help us with that more. But in reality, I don't think urine will be useful. And so we're probably not going to do anything more with it at all. OK, here on this slide, I show the participation in the biomarker study in terms of what kinds of mutations people had. And you can see that um, what I've got on the left on the y-axis is the number of people who had a particular mutation. So there were a lot of samples where it was really one, ind one individual. And, and remember, one of the earlier slides said that um, it might be 40, uh, or you know, maybe half of all patients have private mutations. So I think this just reflects that that fact as well. And so there are really only a few um, where we had um, more more than just a handful of patients with the same mutation. Um, and that's going to be an important point when I come back to how we analyze this data at the end. All right, let me talk about blood um, first. So here we're looking at controls. Um, I'm one of these controls. For all I know, Tracy and Clark are too, but I, I don't know that for a fact. Altogether, we got um, 111 controls aged from 18 to, I think, 65. We're looking at GFAP on the protein um, on the y-axis as a function of age. and Males are in the dark squares. Females are in the uh, open circles. And you can see that um, basically what their BLD means is that um, this is the biological limit of detection. So 46 of these 111 samples were below the biological limit of detection. Um, 
the median um, values was 61. So half of all the individuals um, had values above 61, half had it below 61, and 97.5% uh, limit. So um, uh, basically 2.5% uh, of the samples would be above the value of 861. So this gives you an idea of what normal GFP levels are um, in the control population. And these were people who were uh, self-identified as controls, as not having, um, we asked them not to participate if they had any neurologic um, or psychiatric disease or were on any particular medications we thought might influence GFP levels. So they're self-identified. So what we're looking at in this slide then are the blood levels in Alexander disease patients. And um, we take a subset of those previous controls, and we run them alongside, and this is all done on the same day in the same assay, uh, patients who were classified by age of onset as um, infantile, juvenile, or adult. And what you can see is that um, there is a statistically significant difference between the um, infantile group in the controls and the juvenile group as well as the controls, if you consider them as groups, um, but the adults were no different than the controls. Um, but that's thinking about them as groups. If you think about them as individuals, really um, the message is that it's above this 97.5% limit in only uh, a subset of these patients. And so on an individual basis, it's really only a minority of the patients where you'd say it's, it's really significantly different than the controls. So that's blood levels. Um, what about CSF? So these are CSF levels in what we call a control population. So the controls were children undergoing the CSF tap for diagnostic purposes, but where the CSF was analyzed as normal. So again, the GFAP levels are on the left, uh, on the y-axis, age um, on the x-axis. Um, again, the males are the, um, um, the, the black uh, squares, females are the open circles. And you can see um, there may be slightly higher levels of GFAP in this younger group. Um, we don't really know, um, but otherwise there's really no effect of age. Um, in these uh, in these CSF samples. If you look at the Alexander population then, and now we're comparing them again to a subset of controls, the y-axis here is now a log scale. So um, what you can see, um, if you think about the medium of the controls, it's about 103, the range of 46 to 1,386. The patients uh, are significantly different than the controls, um, much more so than we saw with blood samples. So the median here is over 4,000, and the range was 387 up to um, a little over 24,000. So it's clear that in contrast to blood, where GFAP levels were elevated in only a subset of patients and only modestly, um, the GFAP levels in CSF are elevated in almost all the patients and to a much more significant degree. In fact, if you look at these individuals, it's really only this one individual right down here who was clearly within the control range. And, um, you know, we, we don't really understand uh, what was going on with this particular individual. But you know, still, we believe that GFAP in CSF is going to be an uh, important way to um, to monitor progression. Well, it's worth testing whether it's going to change um, as the disease progresses and whether it's going to be useful um, in tracking response to therapy. So we tried a number of other types of analyses in here. You know, did the GFAP levels somehow correlate with particular genotype, you know, the particular mutation that was present. Did they track, um, differ by sex? Age of onset, duration of illness, proximity to death for the blood samples, 
were collected just within a few months of the of the patients passing away, um, whether or not the patients had fever, seizures, or hydrocephalus. So we tried to consider all of these things. Um, but you know, beginning with genotype, as I mentioned early on, there were a lot of them where we only had one sample from uh, a particular genotype. So the the bottom line is that all of these we try to analyze um, all of these factors and, and see whether any of them really matter. But ultimately, um, the take-home message is that it really only um, mattered in terms of age of onset. CSF was elevated in all groups. Um, that was that was clear, but we couldn't say whether it differed between adults, infantile, and juvenile. Um, as far as blood, it was elevated in just infantile and juvenile onset, not adult. Um, if you think about it in terms of the newer classification system, it, it was really the type 1 patients who had um, had elevations in blood. Another way to think about it is that it may be that only when CSF is elevated above a certain level does it start to spill out into blood. But it's really going to take a lot more comparisons. About our blood and CSF in the same patient before we can really, um, really assess that. So it's worth thinking about if GFAP is in the CSF, how exactly is it getting out there? Um, because we typically think about GFAP as a cytoplasmic structural protein just within the cytoplasm of astrocytes. And, um, and I just made a diagram of an astrocyte here. This blue thing is the nucleus, and then the GFAP would be these these um, red these little red sticks. So one way in which GFAP is thought to be one reason GFAP is in CSF is when astrocytes die. So they completely fragment their cytoplasmic contents, spill out. Uh, eventually, they get degraded, but you know there is that window of time when they're detectable in in fluids. There's another possibility that astrocytes aren't completely dead, but they're sick, and they're sick in a way that their membranes become leaky. So again, some cytoplasmic contents get out into, um, into body fluids. Um, another possibility that's at least speculated about is that there are some situations in which GFAP is actively being secreted. And why it would be secreted, we have no idea. And what controls that secretion, um, we really have no idea. But there are still um, sort of several different scenarios in, in which you can think GFAP is spilling out into body fluids, such as CSF and blood. And as we learn more about these things, um, you know, that may give us more insight into, into interpreting the changes that we see either in the disease um, or in the, um, in the treatment trials where we're looking at response to therapy. So basically, I think GFAP in CSF is going to be an important thing to be measuring going forward. Um, it remains to be proven um, whether it's the best biomarker to use or whether there are going to be other biomarkers that, that may be um, maybe better. So the overall summary of these things, and I, I'm still going to get to a different um, question about other studies that are in the future, but the overall summary about what we talked about today are the genetics um, that you know, there was recently the description of a truncation mutation, but my point is that still all the known mutations predict synthesis of at least some protein. That goes along with the idea that we think it's a toxic effect of a mutant protein that coupled with accumulation above the toxic threshold that's, that's causing the problems. And duplications and deletions have not been found. Um, so we still don't know how to account for the patients who don't have identifiable mutations. Um, and we can't use duplications or deletions yet to uh, account for the variability in, in symptoms. As far as drugs 
you know, clearly lithium can reduce GSAP in some regions, but we think the side effects are too severe. Um, the drug screen and the fly model has identified several interesting targets, but those really, I would emphasize, I think those are pathways that are, um, that warrant future investigation. And we'll be putting a lot of effort into that. Finally, with the biomarker study, GFAP and CSF may prove useful. Um, I don't think blood is useful, but we're going to continue our analyses of blood to see if there are other things that, that are present in blood that might perhaps separately or coupled with the GFAP measurements might prove useful as a, as a combination. So the last slide, and I still will come back to some of the questions that have been asked, um, are new opportunities to participate in research. So clearly, you know, GFAP and CSF we think is going to be useful. It's an invasive thing to collect. Some people may not want to do that. And um, are there other ways to to measure or other types of outcome measures or biomarkers that can be used? So I met, want to mention two studies that um, have just begun um, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and this is under the direction of Amy Waldman. Um, the first one is called Exploring the Natural History of Alexander Disease. Um, the second one is Evaluation of Outcome Metrics in Alexander Disease. The first one is, is really a retrospective natural history study, um, and it really consists of reviewing medical records as well as a telephone interview. So, um, you know, what I mean by natural history is basically the natural course of disease in the absence of treatment. Um, and that's a really important foundation for us to have in order to design appropriate clinical trials when we get there. Um, and it's, it's never been done before, really. Um, so we're hoping Dr. Wallman can do this in a couple of different ways. Um, so the first way is just by this um, review of medical records and the telephone interviews. And that can be done by long, you know, long distance. So any, anybody could participate in this. Um, the second one is a prospective study. So it's starting from day one going forward. And it's observational. So they're actually going to want to perform some types of uh, tests, clinical tests, such as the motor function of swallowing. That one does require a visit to Philadelphia, uh, to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So if you're interested in finding out more information on either of these studies, um, you should contact Geraldine New, who's the study coordinator, and her phone number is here, um, and her email address is down here. So, you know, I really um, hope that people will um, consider participating in um, in one or the, or the other of these studies because it's really going to be critical for um, for what we hope to do in the future. So that's the last slide. <clears throat> but let me go back to some of these other questions. So the, thought, well, the question about steroids, and then there was a question about symptoms. What, what was the question about symptoms? Um, what indicates uh, the progression? Progression, right. Okay, so um, first general question was um, about Alexander symptoms, and are there certain ones that would indicate the presence of the disease versus symptoms that indicate progression? And you know, certainly we have a lot of information about the types of symptoms that are present in the disease. Um, they're not at all specific to Alexander disease, um, but there are things like seizures or developmental delays, spasticity, um, abnormalities of gait. Um, in many cases, it's an intellectual disability, although, you know, neurocognitive functioning has, has never been formally studied. Um, in a group of, of patients. Um, so if, you know, I can't tell you about sort of average IQ scores or anything like that. Um, so, you know, the thing to realize, realize about these symptoms is that they're, they're not specific to Alexander disease. They reflect the 
area of the central nervous system that's affected as much as anything else. Um, and, um, you know, the symptoms by themselves aren't what would make somebody think of Alexander disease. It's, it's the, um, it's usually the MRIs that, that first uh, prompt clinicians to think about Alexander disease and say, gee, this would be worth testing for G3 mutation gen. So that's the first question about presence of disease. Um, as far as what indicates progression, you know, that's the completely open question. We, we don't know which of these symptoms, such as seizures or um, swallowing difficulties um, or changes in voice, which of those which we know are associated, associated with the disease would be worth tracking um, in terms of progression or response to therapy. And, um, you know, there's huge variability in patients and, um, and very few patients have really been studied um, sort of at multiple time points um, to see, see how rapidly these things change over time. Um, so that's really the, point of the natural history studies, both of the natural history studies that that Amy Waldman is going to try to do, figure out which of these are, are going to be the most useful. You know, it may very well be that it's an individual thing, um, that, you know, for one patient, tracking seizure frequency is the key thing. For another, it's, um, it's gait. And when you and some of the things that have been described or used in publications would be um, age at um, loss of unassisted walking. Um, so, you know, when is it that you need to use a cane? When is it that you need to use a wheelchair? Um, things like that. But it's a really open question at this point. So then there was a question about steroids. Um, and steroids are um, very interesting. So we know that there's um, activation of astrocytes and another cell type in the central nervous system called microglia in Alexander disease. Um, there's certainly a lot of reason to believe that steroids would, would um, mitigate that activation. And um, there's even anecdotal um, reports that steroids, at least temporarily, um, reduce symptoms. Um, but they've never been studied in, um, in a formal way, and there are clearly adverse effects. So um, anybody who's been on long-term steroid treatment for things like, um, you know, really severe allergies or, or other types of autoimmune disorders um, know that, that that the side effects of steroids have really been what um, has limited their widespread use. And um, I, I think they are something that, that would be worth testing in a clinical setting in, in some way, but, um, but it hasn't been done yet. We have not, we have not invested um, effort into testing steroids in the animal models, um, ultimately because we think the side effects are really what's going to be limiting, and um, and really we hope we come up with something that's much more effective than steroids. So, I mean, that's our reason for not studying steroids ourselves. And do you have a follow-up question? Is there anybody who's studying the test data that might be Okay, so then there's a question about the studies at CHOP will lead to a clinical trial. Um, the studies at CHOP are designed to be the foundation for a clinical trial. Whether the clinical trial happens at CHOP or somewhere else or at multiple sites uh, remains to be seen. But right now, this is the only um, formal natural history study that I'm aware of anywhere. And whoever does a clinical trial would make use of this information in the design of their study. Okay, second so this now. Is there any research being done in regards to gene therapy um, as a treatment for Alexander disease? Um, so the term gene therapy means many different things. And um, there certainly is research being done 
to um, prevent the um, prevent the expression of GFAP um, by targeting the messenger RNA, and um, that's sometimes referred to as antisense therapy. And and we're we're spending a lot of time and effort on that. Um, what some people mean by gene therapy is replacing the defective gene. And right now, there's no there's no real effort in doing that for Alexander disease because it's not it's not the um, so this gets back to the question that I was um, trying to get out with the genetics that that it's not um, uh, that there are no null mutations for instance it's not the absence of protein that's causing disease and so in other um, genetic disorders where it's an absence of protein, what's meant by gene therapy is that you can deliver a gene that is now producing the missing gene product. And you could do that, um, in theory, in a stable way, and that, that restores um, sort of normal gene function to a person. In the case of Alexander disease, though, we're not missing normal GFAP. We're, we're dealing with an abnormal gene that's producing a toxic protein. So it's a much bigger challenge for gene therapy because you'd have to get rid of the um, of the um, of the mutant GFAP first and then replace it with a normal one. <clears throat> and um, you know that idea is at least being discussed in different um, parts of the body. Um, so, for instance, in in blood disorders where you can take the blood out of the body or take the blood precursors out of the body re-engineer them in, um, in a laboratory and then put them back in by a transplant. So sort of in theory, that sort of thing could be done. But in the central nervous system and replacing astrocytes in that way is something that's really, really far in the future. And so nobody's really doing that right now. <clears throat> um, so there's the. This question about does the CHOP study have access to your records and the NIH information? Um, so that is something that's actually come up, and we're in the process of making that possible. Um, so that it's clear that I've collected a lot of information from the people who have participated in our studies over the years. And in many ways, if those same people would like to participate with the CHOP study, it would be very convenient for everybody concerned if I'm just allowed to share that information with them. So we've re recently got approval from our institutional review board for what to do to make that possible. Um, but I think it's going to take about a month to get all the paperwork um, completed. <clears throat> Basically, what um, the CHOP investigators will do is they'll ask somebody, um, or if it comes up, in their conversation, then they will have a consent form that will be signed, which then is provided to me to give me permission to release that information to CHOP. So it sounds a little cumbersome right now, but it's actually um, it's actually the, the simplest um, of, of many different possibilities that were being talked about. So we're we're pretty happy that the IRBs have approved this strategy for going forward and that uh, we're going to be allowed to share all that information. <clears throat> OK, so Tracy, have I missed anything yet? So are there? Any other questions? I I believe this will um, the recorded version of this will be on our website. With a couple of recording issues, um, so we'll much of the audio be there or no? It, most of it will be there. Most okay. Well, most of the audio will be intact, uh, and that will be up there within a day or so. Is that right? It should be up there within three or five days. 
Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, I want to thank everybody again for uh, joining us today. I'll thank Tracy and Clark um, and everybody who helped us on this end. And, um, you know, perhaps I'll see you in Omaha this summer. Um, and as always, you know, feel free to write me emails if you have any questions. Thank you again. Bye-bye.